Thank you, Georgette. And I just want to say, last year I left here jealous. I saw all these purple clericals, and I thought, that is a fashion statement. So I went out and bought this purple shirt so I can <laughs> sort of fit in. So think about your favorite vacation spot. Got that locked in your mind? Now, envision that you're going to turn to someone at the table. Don't do this, but envision you're going to turn to someone at the table and tell them about that vacation spot. Do you tell them where you're leaving from or where you're going to? It's where you're going to, right? Of course. Now, think of your legacy. And in case you're struggling with the concept of legacy, that's what you want people to say about you when you're dead. Like it or not, choose it or not, each of us will leave a legacy. Just like that vacation, it's where our lives are going to. It's the summation of all of our thoughts, words, and actions. In fact, our legacy won't be measured simply by what we think or simply by what we say. It'll be measured by what? What we do, right. So today, I wanna help you create the legacy that you want. Thomas Kuhn is the American phys physicist and uh, philosopher who identified the concept known as a paradigm shift. That's that phenomena where we experience that aha moment and all of a sudden we see life in a whole new way. Stephen Covey talks about this in paradigm shift and says that the, the magnitude of the inflection of that paradigm shift is directly proportional to how desperately we hold on to our previous beliefs before the shift. There's many examples that we're familiar with, some of which Covey covered in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. For instance, Louis Pasteur's germ theory. That's where sickness was finally understood to be caused by microbes and not an ill humor. Or Copernicus' view of the, of the um, solar system where the sun was the center of the universe and not Earth. And even today, Reverend Childers talked about seeing a verse that he's seen 50 times before and now seeing it in a whole new light. Almost every significant breakthrough in science and in understanding required a break from a well-worn tradition, traditional beliefs. Georgette asked me to tackle two objectives in today's talk. One was to help people make the transition from hearing great speakers and great ideas to putting those into action. The second was to help to build a framework of strategy underneath those actions so they're aligned for a purpose. Building a strategy is actually the easy part. And in the time permitted, we'll only have a chance to kind of skim the waves of that idea. But what's really critical to putting that strategy into place is us experiencing a paradigm shift. So what do I mean by that? If we're to be a building or the city on a hill who is the light that goes out to a sin-darkened world, it will require a bold inflection point in our history as the church. So after 45 years, we're at that X on the graph in terms of fighting to abolish abortion. What we must boldly define today is where we want to be and then figure out a strategy to get there. To do this, we must first break from the false narrative that we're winning the war on abortion. We need to radically shift our paradigm. Now, why do I say this? In this graph, that line leading up to the X is in fact, the numbers of abortions in the United States since 1973. So after a generation, we're literally right back where we started from in 1973. My friend Daniel Craw present, um, penned these words in a blog post on Church of the Resurrection. I have sometime, uh, sometimes imagined myself living during a great human rights struggle and wondered, what would I do? What would I do if I were an American in 1850? Would I perceive slavery for the evil that it was and fight the norms and the institutions? 
in my, to end uh, um, slavery? What would I do if I were a German in 1943? Would I risk my reputation and my livelihood to challenge the system and the, that sent my neighbors to the extermination camps? He goes on to say, a few weeks ago, I got a wake-up call. I am living during a great human rights struggle right now. Implicit in his words are this question. Will I risk my comfort for, and persecution for the benefit of my neighbor? We're going to look at a nine-minute clip. Many of you may have seen this, but when we look, after we look at that, I'm going to paint a picture of how we can build a strategy to overcome it. This is the true story of a German who lived in Germany during World War II. And his church was positioned right by a railroad track that took Jews to the concentration camps. And one time, that train would broke down right outside their church. And they could hear the screams of those being taken to the concentration camps. And instead of going out there and confronting the enemy, the culture of death, they chose to sing a little louder. Think about that. The church, Reverend Childress just talked about it. This is for the church. This message is for the church. We chose to sing a little louder instead of confront the evils of the day and risk our own persecution for the sake of the defenseless. Had this video played at the very end, it's a picture of an innocent babe in, the, in utero. And they, they play a heartbeat, and then it just stops. And it caused me to say this. If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? If a child screams in the womb, do we notice? One more Covey quote. The degree to which our mental maps accurately describe the territory does not alter the existence of that territory. Paraphrased, even if we can't conceive it, the reality is there. We need to rise to the reality and change our paradigm. My friends, the magnitude of our strategy is directly proportional to our honest assessment of where we are today and where we want to be. This graph shows the number of abortions that have taken place since 1973. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we've returned almost to 1973 levels. But can we say that we're winning when after a generation Still, nearly a million children a year are being slaughtered each year in our country. Martin Luther King Jr. in his epic I Have a Dream speech said this, this is no time to take the drug of gradualism. Is preaching once a year, if this is our pro-life checklist, is preaching once a year about sanctity of life going to stem the tide? Is throwing 100 bucks at CareNet going to stem the torrent of death? Look at this image. We are below the falls currently as a church. We're jumping from rock to rock, convincing ourselves that we're making a difference, when really, again, a million children are still pouring over the precipice. The fight is really at the top of the falls where we, as a church, need to focus our attention. We need to stop acting like the Israelites cowering in front of Goliath and the Philistines. Think of David's words. Do we not serve a great God? Who are the Davids among us? We have to have a vision and a purpose and a strategy worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. But isn't the church making a difference, you might ask? Well, I want to share some sto sobering statistics. These come from research by CareNet, and I'll follow that with a story. In America, 14% of a women in this survey by CareNet will admit to having an abortion. The 25% that you see there 
is a study done by the Guttmacher Institute, which is actually a pro-abortion organization. And they say that by the age 45, one-fourth of American women will have an abortion. Now, when I say that, I want to quickly add, if it's one-fourth of American women, it's one-fourth of American men are participating as well. This is not a woman problem. This is a cultural problem. Here's the disturbing factor. According to the study, 70% of those women call themselves Christian. Let that sink in. Guttmacher Institute says that it's 62%. And Guttmacher even goes beyond that and starts to parse it out by denomination. I won't mention the denominations because that's not important. The important thing is that two-thirds of women who are having abortions call themselves Christians. 43% admit to attending a church at least once per month during one of their abortions. And 76% said that the church had no influence on their decision. And here's the dilemma. Only 1% of women surveyed in the CareNet study said that they would seek out someone at the church if they were in a crisis pregnancy. That's why today we need to have an inflection point in the church in our responsibility. The church needs to regain her relevance. But is it ready to? Are we ready to? Some of my friends boldly display these signs showing the images of victims of abortion. And do you know, want to know where they get the most vitriolic response? The church. the church, absolutely. In fact, this cease and desist order was issued by one megachurch in Illinois. They had one abolitionist arrested, and when someone called and pleaded for mercy, they said no. They are going to pursue this abolitionist to the full extent of the law. This is on our watch, ladies and gentlemen. Oz Guinness, in his book, Impossible People, asks, what then of us? Are we living in the light of the great cloud of the witnesses and martyrs who have gone before us? Or in this comfortable condition of the advanced modern world, are we not? It's not persecution that's our enemy, it's privilege. We have to stop wringing our hands, trying to make a difference, while at the same time, trying not to make waves. Let me say that again. We have to stop wringing our hands, trying to make a difference, while not wanting to make waves. One last stroke is needed in this, to paint this landscape of where we are today. Stalin is credited with, Stalin is credited with this expression, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is but a statistic. The sheer number of crosses and graves in this graveyard is a testament to our investment in freedom. But they're largely imperso impersonal, unless what? Unless one of them is your father, or your sister, or your brother, or your mother, or your son, or your daughter. Then it takes on tragic significance. So if we turn Stalin's expression around, it would read, a million deaths is but a statistic, a single death is a tragedy. If you would, open the bags that are at your table and pull out one of the swaddled baits. It's the gold or red or green bag that's at your table. Again, Reverend Childress made reference to this. This is a child at 12 to 13 weeks gestation. I'd like you to hold this child. And I'd like you to think about this poor babe being burned with chemicals or crushed and ripped apart in its mother's womb. And then think about the stats of the church that I just shared with you. We are the defenders of the defenseless. Who then is our neighbor. Who are the Davids among us? 
In my research for this talk, I spoke to several people. One was a young pastor who told me the story of how abortion moved from statistic to stake in his heart. He had a young woman in his congregation who dutifully, if not begrudgingly, showed up to church every Sunday. And at some point, she began to show up on the arm of a scruffy companion. The pastor told me that if you would have stopped him at any point in the journey of the story I'm about to tell you, he would have said that he's pro-life. He knew the statistics, but he felt like his church was different. His church was safe. Well, you can imagine the next phase of the story. The young couple did become pregnant. Now, pastors, picture this scene. The young couple plops down in chairs across from his desk. After a moment, the woman got up and left, and the young man admitted that they had had an abortion. My pastor friend was rocked. He went in search of the young woman and found her sitting in, of all places, a desk in a small child's desk in their children's ministry. Imagine the sight, a grown woman sitting all folded up and gangly in one of those small desks, mindlessly pushing around a puzzle piece, not willing to make eye contact. And as I recall, the pastor told me that he touched her arm and said, Jesus forgives you. And that's when the tears flowed and the heartache flooded out. It was at that moment when he realized that this happened on his watch because he, although he supported life, did not make life part of the DNA of the church. In one gut-wrenching moment, he went from passive pastor to powerful protagonist to protect life. He went, as that old story goes, from being the chicken who's involved in the breakfast to the pig who's committed to the breakfast. I'll let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> My friends, again, you may preach once a year on Sanctity of Life. You may raise 100 bucks for CareNut or other crisis pregnancy center. You may even attend a march or a conference like this. But my concern is that it's not part of our DNA. Are we living our lives as though other lives depend on us? To be effective, we must join the fight full on. Because while we tarry, people are dying. As Telmechilus the monk, I don't know if I said his name right, cried out at the Colosseum in Rome in about 400 AD, in the name of Christ, forbear which was the beginning of the end of the gladiator decimation of lives. I've heard it translated that he screamed out, the killing must stop. The killing of our children and our elderly must stop. We are the defenders of the defenseless. Again, who are the Davids among us that will take up God's calling and defend these poor innocent lives? This is an abortion center that's four and a half miles from Church of the Resurrection. They perform abortions there on Wednesdays and Saturdays. On Wednesday, Wednesdays, no one from Church of the Resurrection is there. On Saturdays, there's 1.2 people. I'm the point two, I'm only there for a little bit. But one mom comes out faithfully with her three little daughters and prays and pleads with those bent on going in and aborting their children. This is the perspective looking out from the abortion center. Those that are there to protect those want, who want to go in for an abortion or shield them block our view. And you can see there's an underwhelming number of people there trying to beckon them to come out. My friend and I, oops, my friend and I have about 20 seconds to overcome seemingly unstoppable raging torrent of 20, 30, 40 years of cultural indoctrination. Do the math. 20 seconds as the numerator over 20 to 30 to 40 years of culture. This, my friends, is our reality today. So, what to do about it? Well, we need to create that inflection point we must learn from the past and then focus on the future. 
And we can do this by clarifying our mission, our vision, and our values. Declaring these, believe it or not, will set our strategy. So on this image, if we're here at the bottom, jumping from rock to rock, and we want to be there at the top of the falls, stemming the tide of abortion, there at the top is our vision. It's that mountain peak off in the distance. It's where we want to be. And is it to abolish abortion? If we agree on that point, we have to be clear on it because our congregations are not. If it is to abolish abortions, then we need to declare it. We need to make it known. We need to communicate it and we need to make it part of our DNA as a church. It can't be a once a year message. It can't be an afterthought in the prayers of the people. It has to be how we live every day. It's like eating garlic. It has to exude out of every pore. But the most important thing to make this vision a reality, look at the slide, to say when. Because you see, a where without a when is just a dream. If you tell your kids or your spouse or a friend that you're going to take them on vacation, what are the first two questions they ask you? Where and when, right? If you say somewhere, sometime, you're going to quickly extinguish their enthusiasm and their focus. Declaring when drives your strategy. Two years ago, Church of the Resurrection declared a financial campaign they called Moved by Jesus. The leaders set a dollar target and they set a timeline. When they set the where and the when, they were able to separate the nice-to-haves from the need-to-have. Because you see, nice-to-haves are just that. They're nice-to-have. But they don't move the needle. It's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Nice to have them all nice and neat, but you're still sunk. You have to declare the when. Nice-to-haves make you feel like you're doing something, but they confuse activity for action. And that, my friends, is the death knell of effectiveness. Declaring a where and a when makes dreams tangible and thus doable. Where and when drive strategy, and a winning strategy is bounded by what we call lead indicators. Write that word, those words to name, lead indicators. Lead indicators are those predictable, controllable, measurable activities that will get us to our goal. So let's talk about the Moved by Jesus financial campaign and think about what some of those financial indicators or some of those lead indicators might have looked like. Well, if you see our, our learning curve here, the first one could have been, let's set a vision night so that everyone understands where we're going, why we're going there, what it means to us as a church and a people. Then we could think about how do we track the unique number of givers and make sure that we're on target getting the number of givers that we want to include. Then perhaps, how many times are we going to mention it in a sermon and fold it into the philosophy of how we do life? Next, how many times might we put it in a weekly announcement? Because every time we do, we reinforce the message, we reinforce the vision, we reinforce our goal. Maybe we should set up a schedule of calls to large donors from the past. Set up the table of who they are, make the calls, so many per week, so many per month, so many per year, and that's going to put us on track. And then finally, letters to the congregation. Again, reinforcing the what and the why, what we stand for, why we're doing this, and what the goal is, and by when. When you cobble together all of these controllable behaviors, the likelihood of achieving your objective is much higher. If abolishing abortion is our objective, we have to identify the right lead indicators. 
each of us individually and together as a church need to decide where we are going and by when. That's the hard work that we have to do when we leave this place and we get back to wherever we call home on Monday morning. We don't have time to, to diagnose that here in a 25 minute talk, but I'll give you three ideas and you can build on those from there. I mentioned that there's an abortion center four and a half miles from Church of the Resurrection. Perhaps we need to dare ourselves to dream big. We need to ask ourselves to ask the question, what if? What if we put res at the center of that circle and said that we're not going to allow abortions in our geographic area and we're going to end abortion in our area by 1231-19? What would that do to our strategy? What if we partnered with the 50 or more churches in that same geographical four and a half mile radius and said that we're going to put a stake in the ground and we're going to be ecumenical in protecting life. And we took a hold of the area that surrounds our church. What would that do to our strategy? What if instead, or in addition, Church of the Resurrection said, no, we're going to partner with other Anglican churches in our area, and we're going to make DuPage County abortion-free by 1231-19. What would that do to our strategy? What if every church in the Upper Midwest Diocese said, we're going to claim territory around our church and make that abortion-free by such and such a date? And what if we got really crazy and we said, you know what? In the Upper Midwest Diocese, we're claiming our entire territory and we're going to seek to strive to make it abortion free in three years. My friends, what would that do to our strategy? Americans in 2015 gave $373 billion to charity. Of that, how much do you think went to protect life? 20%? 17 percent? 17 percent? Three? Four? This is to scale. 0.2% went to protecting life. Now, 0.2% of 373 billion is still a pretty big number. That's 700 million dollars. That's spread across approximately 4,000 pro-life organizations. Sounds pretty good, right? Unless you compare it to Planned Parenthood, a single organization which has a budget of 1.3 billion, almost double in one organization what every other organization that is dedicated to defending life combined has. And for those of you who know anything about putting organizations together, you always have overhead, you always have redundancy. So you've got 4,000 organizations out there trying to parse up $700 million, all equally sharing in administrative and minutia that where we coalesced could be put towards actually saving lives. So my question to you, how much of your church's budget, how much of your diocese's budget is dedicated to life. Is life just another ministry? What if we redeployed our building funds and put that money towards saving lives? What if we challenged ourselves to invest in eternal foundations and not temporal ones? What if we doubled or tripled or even multiplied Georgette's budget by 10x? What would that do to our strategy? I'm sad to say that Illinois has the distinction of being the first state, and dare I say only, that has proactively legislated taxpayer-funded abortion. Why the picture of these crosses on this point? Because according to Illinois' one and only pro-life lobbyist, he estimates that that could equal 12,000 more babies who will be aborted 
each year just because of this one piece of legislation. We lost this battle. It got to Governor Rauner's desk. We lost it by three votes. It takes 60 votes. The other side had 62. Bishops from the Catholic Church were calling legislators, asking them to not approve this legislation. What do you think they heard from Protestant churches? Crickets. The silence was indeed deafening. What if we called our congregations to vote? Because when Christians coalesce, things happen. And yet, because we didn't and because we don't, approximately 12,000 more babies are going to be dead next year. Is that the signal? Good, I'm on page 10 out of 27. <laughs> Okay, so I'm leaving this image up here for a few moments and I'm going to say, imagine where you are today, where we are today, and imagine where we could be next year. Imagine coming into this conference and reporting the abortion center in our diocese has been shuttered. We updated our bulletins. In fact, I got to explain this one. Roland Warren last year spoke about the single biggest detractor to women seeking counsel at the church was no on-ramp. I know of one church that decided to put a notice in their bulletin. It took them eight months to work through the bureaucracy to do that. And then they only show it once per month. What about weeks two and three and four? What if we updated our bulletins the week we got back and said that we invite men and women who are in crisis pregnancy to come and talk? We are here to walk along beside you. What if we chose to weave pro-life announcements or examples into every sermon? What if our prayers of the people declared openly and unapologetically that we support the life of the unborn, their mothers, their fathers, the elderly, and the infirm? Whatever we do, we have to make saving life part of our DNA. Abolishing abortion and protecting the elderly and infirm has to be as natural as breathing. Pastors and bishops, this next comment is directed specifically at you. You are the leaders. You have the opportunity to share a great vision and equip and encourage your people to attain it. Nothing wonderful was ever attained without leadership's first inspiring. You have the opportunity to spur your congregations to greatness, to create a legacy bigger than any one of us individually. My friends, the choice is now ours. We'll hear great speakers in addition to what we just heard from Reverend Childress. Each of us must figure out what we're going to pick up from each of them, make our own, and most importantly, act upon. Whether we're called as Georgette, I think she mentioned, but if she didn't, whether it's to advocate, educate, or minister, we need to support these callings with lead indicators that point towards abolishing abortion. We have a choice. We can be a stick or a salmon. Do we go with the cultural flow or do we fight the impossible odds with the tenacity and the heart of a salmon? We can't make a difference without making waves. A stick only makes a wave once when it falls from the tree of life. It never again makes a difference. Each one of us in this room could be the next Corey Tamboom, Martin Luther King Jr., Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or Mother Teresa. Driving that decision will be what each of us decides today. This decision applies equally to us as individuals as well as to the church with a capital C. Indeed, we're here today as the ACNA because in 2009, some inspired leaders got together and declared no more. And they cast a vision for what serving Christ could be. 
So too, now is our chance to say no more. Not the killing must stop, the killing will stop. And let's set a date. And finally, one author put his life philosophy this way. He lived in crescendo. He was not looking to totter off into retirement. He believed, no matter how old he was, that his best days were always in front of him. He chose to live to the next crescendo. And so it is with us. Each of us has the opportunity, starting now, to create the legacy that we want to leave. And working together, we can be that city on a hill. And as the bride of Christ, we can create a legacy equal to our creator.